Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, if you have a Bible... Do a little, just before we do that, because the book of Revelation is not an easy book. Um, it was, it's in a style called apocalyptic, which is a, a genre of, of literature, a kind of writing that was used between 200 years before Jesus and... The word poetry means to make something, something happen in your mind. And the point of revelation is that God wants something to happen in your imagination. So when you read it, it's not what you see. You have to ask, what does it mean? Because it's, it's not the sort of language you usually use. So anyway, let's, let's look at the story. Let's get to this. It's ama- one of the most amazing bits of even literature in the world is Revelation chapter 5, isn't it, really, in many ways. But really, just to, before we get there, just to look at the world this morning, you come in off the street, as it were, and you look at the world, and you look at Ukraine, and people have been displaced, and it's, it's desperate, isn't it? People have been killed, and it's going to get worse, and I was reading about Bible schools in, Amer- in Ukraine that have been blown apart, and many, it's a mess, uh, and then you look at what's happening in America where kids being killed and, our, and right through the world. You go to Yemen. Um, I, I could take you through all the countries and you think, God, what's going on? Our prisons are full. This year in Britain we will terminate 200,000 babies' lives in the, in the wombs of the mothers. And you could go on and you think, goodness me, what is going on? It, it's, the world seems broken. It's a mess. And um, I'm sure John felt like this. John, this old man, this is this, is this old man, is the last of the apostles. He's um, eight in his 80s. He's on this island 40 miles west of Turkey. Um, it's, it's a penal colony. And he's thinking, what is going on? You know, 40,000 Christians would be killed in, through the reign of that one uh, emperor, Domitian. And, and he looks at the churches in chapters 2 and 3, and it's, they're really struggling. Is it, is it really, is it meaningful? Is anything worthwhile? Is anything worthwhile? It's a mess. Some are losing heart. Some have lost their property. And, and uh, we could illustrate a thousand ways and uh, and yet he has this wonderful vision isn't he the first chapter he has this, Jesus appears in the, the risen Christ appears in all his glory and then he has a sort of opens the door it's, if, we, if we in modern terms we would say he clicked his sort of mouse three times twice and, and this vision appears God as the spirit opens it on his screen as it were of of the Lord and all the, the angels and the thunder and lightning and thrones and and elders and strange living creatures all it's just amazing terrifying wonderful and um, and he looks at it and um, but then he notices and we move into chapter five he says and then he says and then I saw on the right hand of him this is the Lord who sat on the throne a scroll written on both sides. In those scrolls, you know, you roll them in. You wrote the message on the outside and the summary you wrote on the outside. And, and this scroll, is, it knows, it re, it's only a representative thing, but it represents so much. It represents the lives and wants of every human. But it also represents God's plans and purposes for judging evil and the world's sin and also for the blessing of his people. It's all in there. Not only that, it is the title deeds of this planet. And, and that's what he's saying because, and John knows this, that this world has been hijacked. It's, it is not as it's meant to be this Sunday morning. And John knew that on that Sunday morning. He knew it wasn't meant to be like this. Because he knew that Satan, whom Paul the apostle calls the God of his age, has hijacked, he's taken this planet, this world of his own. 
And, it, and, and as Paul says, it's now subject to frustration. Everything's frustrated. There's something wrong. It's out of sync. It's, it's out of kilter. It's not as it should be. It's been hijacked. I mean, John himself says, the God of this world lies on, sorry, the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. And when you remember when he comes to Jesus, Satan comes to Jesus, and the, the third temptation in the wilderness, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says to him, I will give you all these. Just bow down and worship me. Now the thing that strikes you, Jesus never contests his right to offer them. Because he knows, Jesus knows that he has usurped these. And so he knows it's not as it should be. And and it's a mess. And then he, he says, I saw a mighty, a, a, a large angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to take the seal, to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one, he says, in heaven, none of the, Gabriel or all the great angels could do it, nor on the earth, none of the, the, the godly men and women of the past or the apostles of the, the present of that day as it were or, the, or under the earth none of the, any of us did none of them were they none of them has got that ability that character that wholeness whatever it took to do it they can't do it and because no one was found who can approach such a God and, and so he thinks is, is it no, is nothing going to work out? Is this planet just going to, as a mess, is there no meaning? Is there no justice? Are the wicked going to get away with it? Is, it, is, that, how, is that how this planet is going to go on? Is it it? All our prayers, all our persecution, is that it? And John says, I just wept and I wept because I saw the outworking of it. If, if, if God's plans are not going to be to work out, it's just a waste of time. It's more than that. It's desperate. It's, it's just desperate. And, and it's all meaningless. And every knee will not bow to Jesus. Where is justice? He must have thought that every, every day. Where is justice? And he says, I wept and I wept. And you can live either way. Some say, well, that's it. That's it's how life is. Let's just party till we drop. Or they say, well, let's, it is a waste of time, and they, you know, let's take our lives. And th- th- that's the alternative. But anyway, then one of the elders said, look at the text. One of the elders says, do not weep, do not weep for the lion. See, that's a key word in Revelation, the word see, look, see, the lion of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to. To open the scrolls and to, and it's seven seals. Now he's talking about Jesus, and he says, "The Lion of Judah." It's all taken from um, Genesis forty-nine. Where, where, remember, one of Jacob's sons, Judah, his tribe. From his tribe will come one who will rule. See, Judah, you are, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from your prey, my son, like a lion. He crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dare rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nation shall be his. This is it. The Messiah was always called, well, he, that was the name for him, but the Lion of Judah, the Lion. He will, he will produce, the tribe of Judah will produce this Lion, this man. Now, why a Lion? Why a Lion? Well, it's obvious, isn't it, really? Because it epitomizes that which is strong and fierce. You don't mess with lions. I've been in safari parks in South Africa, and every time you see a lion, you don't see others with it, perhaps a few lionesses. But the other animals keep away. They're frightened. You don't mess with lions. I remember once having a lion's skull in my hand. I thought, 
So if these canines got hold of you, <laughs> you wouldn't last long. And once Frank and I and Eileen and Christine were in a minivan going through a safari park, and we had a flat tire, and we, we stopped by a fence, and then somebody would change the tire. And then the, a lion came, because they just released into a pet, fortunately it was an enclosure, a lion and a few new lionesses. Well, this thing was over there, and we were, the, the minibus was here. I tell you, that lion, the noise, awesome, frightening. The guy who changed the tire, cha- it be any F1 engineer. <laughs> I mean, we, to get, I, but just it was so frightening. Well, Jesus comes as a lion. It, there's a fierceness about him. There's a passion for justice and truth and righteousness and the honor and the glory of God. He comes. He begins his ministry, remember, right at the beginning and at the end, he goes into the temple. Now, understand this. Israel was the nation that God had called to represent him to the nations, to be a light to the nations, sons of Abraham. And they'd foul it up. They'd compromised. And Jesus comes in the temple, turns the tables over. And he says, how dare you turn my father's house into a supermarket just to make money? Well, it was more than that, but... uh, and then he goes to the leaders, the, the, Christ, the Jewish leaders who are meant to teach the Torah, the truth of God. He says, you whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites, you snakes, you brood of vipers. You, he goes on. He says, you take the key away for the door and you want anybody in. He really goes for them. When he speaks, there's authority, there's power with him. When he speaks, demons flee. They don't mess with him. When he speaks, even waves settle down. No, no, this this is is a powerful person. And he comes. He has a passion for truth. And um, he comes to Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, he says, who killed the prophets and you stole those who sent to you. Oh, yes, the Jews expected the Messiah to be a lion. But they expected him to chase their enemies away, the pagans, the Greeks, the Romans. But this, this lion comes, this person comes, and he heals the sick. And not only that, he heals the sick of foreigners. And then he dies. What sort of a lion is this? And he comes. And John, I mean, we have to realize this. That he, this is not just any ordinary human being. He is fully God as well as fully man. I mean, John says he was in the world and the the world was made by him. I mean, we're talking about somebody who's powerful, omnipotent. You know, let me take a sheet of paper. Let me just lose you for a minute. Let's assume this sheet of paper, this thickness, I don't know how many millimeters, not even a millimeter. That is the distance from... Our Earth to the Sun, 92 million miles. Assume that thickness is 92 million miles, right? To get to our nearest star, mountain sheet upon sheet, at 92 million miles distance, it is 70 feet of paper. That's our nearest star. The diameter of our universe, of our universe, sorry, not universe, our galaxy, is. If you, if you put 92 million miles sheets up, it is three, 310 miles high of sheets of that thickness, 92 million miles. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm lost. And, and our galaxy is a small galaxy among the 125 billion galaxies. And John says, all things were made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. Now, that's the person we're talking about. This is the Lion of Judah. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Here he comes. And he comes. And you don't mess around with him when he speaks. You do it. You act. I went to, I remember going to see a consultant about my eyes, and the lady sat me down, and she said this. If you don't get those eyes seen by the end of the week, boom, 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 boom. Go private. Okay. 
So I, I, I didn't go out in the streets there. Oh, that was a nice word. I tell you, I got on the phone as fast as I could. Now multiply that a thousand times. When Jesus speaks, people either ran toward him or ran away. There was an incredible authority about him. And not only that, he's the root of David. In other words, David comes from him. He is pre-existent. He is before David. But not only that, at the end of Revelations, he is the shoot of David, the offspring. And of, he comes out of David. And J David, Nathan says to David, remember, in 2 Samuel 7, he says to, to David, from your seed, from you, will come one whose kingdom will never end. No, he's not talking about Solomon. He's talking about this person who is Jesus. And um, he is the root of, of David. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. But why is he able? Why is he able to take the scroll? Why? Well, you've got this lion. This lion. And he says, I turn. Well, look what he says. I saw a lamb. That's the, that's the paradox. The book of Revelation is all about the lamb. 27, 28 times, it's all about the lamb. It's only other six times in the rest of the New Testament. It's all about the lamb. He, he looks for a lion and he sees a lamb. It's, it's strange, strange. And um, you see, Jesus knew that before he could take this scroll and, and work out the plans of God, he had, to do, he had to deal with sin. He had to deal with Satan. He had to deal with death. He had to deal with hell. He had to deal with judgment. He had to deal with these things. And that's why he came. He says now, he says, now is the... The, 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 for the, the, the judgment of this world, now is the prince of this world cast out. And he, he knows as he goes to the cross, he's going to do mortal combat with the powers of Arm that, That's Armageddon. If ever there was an Armageddon, there'll be no greater conflict than what happened on that cross. And by his death, it says, the scripture, he, he might destroy him who has the power of death. And Paul says that he disarmed principalities and powers, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. So he comes. But then, so he says, I turned and I saw a lamb. Now let's look, give you the text. I saw a lamb. That's the first thing about things. He is. As if it had been slain. The word the slain is a really weak word. The word means slaughtered. It is, this, this animal has been dealt with most severely, physically, as it were. And remember when Jesus was raised from the dead, the, the one thing he showed to his disciples, he showed them his hands and his side. The, the wounds are still there. His body has, in one sense, been changed, but he's, he's, it's different, but the, the wounds are still there. But you see, this is the story of the whole, of the Bible in many ways, the Old Testament. It's the lamb. It's the lamb. I was talking to a Jewish guy this morning in the woods, and he said to me, he would like to invite me to his Passover. Now, the Passover, um, when the Jews did it, a lamb was killed for every family. And Jesus comes, and he's, Jesus' half, his half cousin said to him, John, behold the lamb of God. That takes away the sin. He comes as the Passover lamb. He dies on pa Passover Eve. And not only that, this is all, every day they would kill a lamb or more in the temple. That lamb dies for the sin of the people. That's what Isaiah said four, seven, 700 years before. He was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace was upon him. That's what it's all about, the Bible. And he comes. And Paul sums it, I mean, sums it up wonderfully in, um, in Romans 3. God presented him. The Father presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, a, sac a propitiation of sacrifice, to turn away the wrath of God through his blood. Why? Not, be, not initially because of us. He did this, look what Paul says, to demonstrate his justice. The point of the cross 
was to show to the universe that God is just. He will not compromise. His law must be satisfied. Sinners must be punished. Guilt must be dealt with. Justice must reign through the planets. He comes. How does he do it? Amazing grace. He comes as a lamb. As a lamb. It's amazing. I mean, the only thing that ever, will ever be man-made in heaven are the wounds of Jesus. And they'll be there from all eternity. His wounds that visible above in glory. There they are. Beautified. Wonderful. Wonderful. If you ever think, if you ever should doubt in glory that you're not loved, you just see the, the wounds. <laughs> and he overcame his enemies. You remember, we talked, uh, the, the scroll represents in one way the title deeds of this planet, of this earth. And they've been stolen by the enemy. It's a bit like, you know, in the Old Testament, remember if you, if you, you each family had a, had a bit of land, property. And sometimes you lost your property through various means. And you, how do you get your property back? Well, you had to have what's known as a, a goel, Hebrew, or a kinsman redeemer. And he had three things about him. Firstly, he had to be a relative. And Jesus becomes a relative. The word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. He becomes one of us. God becomes a man. Secondly, you have to be willing. He said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. And second, thirdly, you have to pay the price. And the price, we haven't tend to fully unpack it this morning, is the price of our redemption. Is his blood. And, and the blood of the Son of God has infinite value. And that's why we, we, we read and we will say, you are worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll and don't miss it. Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And that's it. <laughs> and Jesus comes. Not in some vain hope, perhaps it will, perhaps it will have a people. No, it will, it's certain. He will see the travail of his soul. And he will be satisfied, says Isaiah. <laughs> but look at the next thing. Not only is he slain. Look at the next thing. I saw a lamb. As if it had been slain. Standing. That's a wonderful word. Standing. He's alive. He's not, he's not in the tomb. He's not in the grave. He's not in the ground. He's raised. He's in the heavenlies. He's been raised. That's the, that's the great thing on, on, many, on many counts. But just to come back to you, how do you know your sins are forgiven? How do you know that all this, that God has, satis, that has been satisfied by Jesus' death for you? The resurrection. That's the proof. Paul says to the Romans again, he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. What does all that mean? The fact that he has done enough is that God has raised him bodily. Let me try the illustration. Let's see if it works. You know, you, I don't know where you do your shopping. I won't. Some of you are waitress people and some of you are obviously older people, but... <laughs> You can tell by looking. No, no. <laughs> I went to Tesco's anyway. And you go to Tesco, you fill your trolley and the person. And on the way out, imagine the man says to you, excuse me, sir, have you paid for that? I, you know, you must look shifty anyway. And I said, yes. Are you sure? And I said, a receipt. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. The point is this. The resurrection of Jesus is the receipt that God says he's done enough. That's it. That's it. That's it. When Satan tempted to despair, up with our look and see him there. On your way, Satan. Who is to condemn? It's Christ who died. 
But that's it, really. But let quickly, we must move on, because John wants me to finish before tea. <laughs> anyway, look at the next point. He's not only wounded, slaughtered. He's not only standing. He is, where is he? Standing in the center of the, of the throne, encircled by the living creatures, the four living creatures. Where is this? Where is this Jesus? He's in the center. The Lamb is in the center. Why? Because he is God. That is why he is fully God. And, and as if to, to doubt that. He had seven horns. Now, I said earlier, when you look at, this, when you look at Revelation and apocalyptic literature, you don't just say, what, what, it, what do I see? You say, what does it mean? Now, I've had many years of my life dealing with sheep. I've never seen a seven-horned sheep. But you remember, horns in the Bible are to do with strength, power, authority. Seven is the number of completion, perfection. He has perfect strength, perfect power. He is omnipotent. He's all-powerful because he's the son of God. And he goes on. Not only that, he has seven eyes. I, I guess this is representative stuff. It represents the Holy Spirit, his wisdom. As, Paul, as the writer says, you know, the, the seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He has perfect wisdom. He has perfect knowledge because he is fully God. That is why he's in the center. On this Sunday morning, Jesus is at the center of the universe. He stands. And um, that's why he, he <laughs> John commands, even, well, he, he indicates everybody, even the Jews who would never worship anyone but God. He says, now... To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, the Father and the Son are together. Be praise and honor, glory and power. But this is the strange thing. This is, this. So we are called to see Jesus as a man of great authority in, seated in the place of authority. We'll come to that when we talk about his intercession. But Jesus, this is it. he doesn't overcome by being a lion. He overcomes by being a lamb. That's the paradox. The lion is the lamb. The lamb is the lion. The king of the beast is the sacrificial lamb. Jesus is the lion of Judah, but he's also the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And only by becoming a lamb will he fulfill the, the work God has given him to do. And that's what it's about, you see. And the lion, who is the lamb, is, brings about God's purposes of judgment and blessing. And um, that's why they say, you are worthy. You are worthy. That's the great word, axios ea, the great word that the, the Greeks and Romans sh shouted to the emperor. You are worthy, axios. And they shouted, Jesus. Now, I never get beyond, you'll have to hear Rich Horn's sermon last week because we're saying the same thing. And Richard quoted from Philippians 2. You have to always go back to Philippians 2. I, it's so wonderful that this God, this God should become a man. Who, Jesus, who didn't count equality to be God as something to be grasped, to be hung on to all costs. No, no, but he, he didn't consider it. He made himself nothing. He didn't just, it wasn't passive. And, and taking the very nature of, of a, a servant and being be made in human likeness and having the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And being became a beat even unto death. I mean, you can never get away with that. You might not agree with it or you might not call it, but that's the heart of Christianity. Our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. It's wonderful. Therefore, God has exalted him. But there's a principle of life here. Paul is using that as a thing how we should live. You should have the same attitude. That's what he's saying. You see, when they come to kill Jesus, the crowd says, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them. Which is the greatest demonstration of power? You see, that's how it works, you see, in silence. He, he 
takes the hurts of others. And uh, see, all our forgiveness, all our life, all our hope, all our security, all our everything was won by weakness in a strange way, by death, you know? And um, he shows God's contempt for the world's wisdom and power. And um, he chose, you know, he shows the, the, the apparent weeks of God is stronger than the, the supposed strength and power of men. Right? That's what it's about. <laughs> but this is the way we are called to live. This is the way you're going to win your victories. This is it. Right? I mean, who wants trouble? Who wants problems? Who wants hardships? <sighs> Nobody. Paul said, I, I had this thorn in the flesh. The apostle Paul said, I had this thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was, whether it was an illness or an impediment of some kind, whether it was a op continual opposition from people who harassed him. And he said, three times I pleaded. And you can, that guy could plead. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect. Perfect. Not improved, but perfect in weakness. Now, it's hard to come to terms with that. You know, <laughs> and that's really, you see, we're always praying for power. I am. You know, we're always, oh, power for this and that. But it's the way of the Lamb. You know, Paul says, we have this treasure in pots of clay to show the surpassing excellence may be of God and not ours. Sometimes we really are crackpots, aren't we? <laughs> but that's how it works. Even Jesus, especially Jesus, he, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. It's an active thing. He didn't say, well, we'll see how it goes. No, I, he committed himself. Now, let me just say that for some people here, you know, and I'm the same, we drift. And God says, faith is an active thing. Say, so, well, we'll see. No, don't say, we'll see. Say, I am going to trust God. Not what I say, I, it's an active thing. Jesus trusted himself, and he's the son of God, but he still trusted himself. It's an active thing. But it's the way. It's the way of, it's not a way of resignation. I'm not going, that's not saying that at all. To be a servant is to go the way of the lamb. It's the only way that works. If you want the power of the spirit, it's not the big stage and the razzmatazz. It's the way of the towel and the basin. It's the way of the servant. That's what it's about. I saw a lovely illustration uh, the other day. In a, it, was about, it was a special Olympics, it was, in Seattle. And it was really for mentally handicapped and physically handicapped youngsters. And they had this, huge thousands were there. And they had this 100-yard dash. And uh, so these, I don't know, these kids set off one little lad fell and started crying. So all the others stopped. They all stopped instead of going for the tape. They all stop and come back. And one little girl with a Down syndrome, she gave him a big kiss. And they all joined hands. And they ran together to the line. The point is, the crowd stood to their feet and applauded them for 10 minutes. Because, you see, by relinquishing personal victory... The children achieved a far greater triumph. Well, it's a, it's a sort of poor illustration of what I'm trying to say. But that's what it's about. And finally, and I must stop, it all leads to worship. And that's another sermon, as it were. But, uh, but it should do. I mean, they're worshiping and they've never sinned in, through glory. They've never done what you've done. They've never thought what you've thought. Things you're ashamed of. And things that have fouled life, but it's all gone. You know, it's gone. You can't find it. It's not from the eye cloud. It's gone. It's wonderful. It's, it takes away. It's all gone. Total freedom. Just as you worship. Just think for a thousand. You just you just worship. Just the ineffable glory of God for a thousand years. <laughs> And then you can have a wander around. Then you, you know, once you've done, <laughs> not really, but 
Because he says, you've made us as priests to our God. You've a kingdom and priests to our God. And God, and we will reign on earth. Jesus is going to come back to earth. But in the, until that time, we are meant to reign. We're meant to reign by being lions. Just let's be bold as a lion. But we're meant to be servants as lambs, right? That's what it's about. And we worship because he's worthy. He's worthy. They don't have a lot of hymn books in heaven. They just have one or two. They just, because they, don't, they can't, can't get anything better. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, I was watching the football last week. I like football. But last Saturday, and the guy said, I couldn't believe it. He said, um, you ladies will forgive me, but he said, where can you get such drama like this? And I thought, you, sunshine, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, we're in something wonderful. God becomes a man. That we might become children of God. God becomes a man and dies on a cross for rebels and sinners. That you and I through all eternity might enjoy incredible bliss and pleasure and fulfillment. And etc, etc. That we'll tell you about for the next 20,000 years. He did all that. And sends his spirit and says, I'll keep you going until you get And all the rest of it, you, you will get every week. I, I like, don't tell me about a bag of wind, my friends. And I like football. Drama? We're in the drama. This is, and this is the real deal. No. Worthy is the lamb. We're slain. People say to me, well, nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody does anything for me. The Son of God shed his blood for you. What more can he do? You are loved. <laughs> well, not well. Believe it. You're not as much a miserable sinner as you think you are. You're worse than that, but he still loves you. And we're called to be priests, to offer to him prayer in constantly and worship. So our prayers will rise like incense. And God will smell that sweetness. And that's it. And it will never stop. The endless song, right? Crowning the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never cease for all eternity. Is that you sing that? That's what it's about, isn't it? Or are you saying, well, it's very interesting, but I'll take my chances. Don't take your chances, my friend. I'd rather reign in hell than serve on earth. Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Your, your invincible ignorance will get you into hell. Now, the, what more can he do than what he's done? He has shed his blood that you might be a child of God. What more can he do? And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.